All right, we've been on our series. Hadn't been been here in a while, have we? I feel like I haven't been up here in forever. We've been on been on our series, the battlefield of the mind. How many know the mind is like a bad neighborhood? You don't want to go there alone. Is this thing echoing a little bit, or is it? I get a little echo in this thing. Anyway, we've been talking, we've uh, titled this series called Stinking Thinking. This definitely is echoing. How many of you have ever had any stinking thinking before? But we have to learn to deal with the stinking thinking and learn to think about what we're thinking about, become intentional. And so that's what this series is really about. It's about the battlefield of the mind. But it's really about the mind because the battle goes on between the ears, doesn't it? The mind is a word newest, a Greek word newest. doesn't refer so much to the physical brain, but our intellect, our understanding, our human reasoning, our thinking processes, or our belief systems. Francis Tran Japan says that Reminds us that the place where Jesus was crucified is called Golgotha. I had a chance to stand in the church of the sepulchre which covered Golgotha, the place of the skull where Jesus was crucified. If we are going to be effective in our spiritual warfare, which is what the battle of the mind is all about, about warfare, the first field of conflict where we must learn, well, this is still echoing bad. The first field of conflict where we must learn to warfare is, is in the battleground of the mind, the place of the skull. It's the territory of the uncrucified thought life that is the beachhead or forefront of the satanic assault. To be able to defeat the devil, we must be renewed in the spirit of our mind. That's in Ephesians 4.23, not just the mind, but the Spirit of the mind. You know, First Second Timothy one seven says we have not been given a spirit of intimidation, but a power of love and a sound mind. Our new man in Christ, we have the very mind of Christ. Imagine that we have God's mind. <laughs> My mind sometimes I feel like I'm going cuckoo, literally, and I have to remember that's the old mind. My new mind is a sound mind. That means a healthy, whole, redeemed, rescued mind that functions the way God intended it to be. But we've also got our old mind, which has been uh, perverted and twisted and corrupted, and we've got to renew that spirit of the mind because it's a spiritual war. So <clears throat> when we talk about spirits, what we're really talking about is attitudes. So the battle is between the ears, the skull, it's the uncrucified, unyielded, unsurrendered, undisciplined thought life, the belief systems, or the thinking processes. And so we have to learn to deal with our stinking thinking. <clears throat> stinking thinking is defined as unrestrained, undisciplined, unbridled, wrong thinking, illogical, that's irrational, unreasonable, unhealthy, it's thinking that has been lied to, deluded, deceived, corrupted, polluted, tainted, perverted, twisted, demented, all these crazy things are all things that the devil has used to create a warped, undisciplined mind that needs to be renewed. And so we've got to learn to think about what we're thinking about. We have to be intentional. <coughs> we have to learn to discipline that mind. That sound mind means a mind that's disciplined. So, you know, discipline is something that takes practice. It takes a habit. And so this renewing of the mind, all this stuff in Romans 12 too, it, it takes time. And it took years to mess up our thinking and give us thinking thinking. It's going to take time to correct that, but we might as well get started. Amen? Amen. And get to work on it. And our scripture has been in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6. We'll go ahead and read that passage. Kind of remind us and bring us back up to speed Paul is talking to the Corinthians and he says even though or though we walk or live our life in an environment that is in the flesh in a fleshly body 
We don't war according to that flesh. <coughs> For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but we've been given divinely powerful weapons for the destruction of fortresses and we are destroying speculations and lofty things that's where we're headed next we're going to talk about speculations and lofty things what are those that are raised up against the knowledge of god and we are taking thoughts captive that's another lesson taking thoughts captive to the obedience of christ and we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever our obedience is incomplete <coughs> So we talked about the weapons of our warfare. Isaiah 54, 17 says that no weapon formed against us will prosper. How many know the devil's always trying to kill, steal, and destroy? He wants to take us out. He's 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 always he has his own set of weapons. Okay? Very schemes, strategy, traps, all kinds of different strategies that are well planned, well thought out strategies. I mean, you know, he he's shrewd. He's definitely true. And he's trying to form, take those weapons and form us to cause us not to prosper. But God wants us to prosper. And, and so even though he's forming those things, we don't have to let him prosper. In fact, we can prosper. How can we prosper? Because God has given us superior weapons, superior strategies, superior, superior uh, ways, plans, and, and schemes. And, and these Weapons are not just physical weapons, but we've given divinely powerful weapons that, that trump the devil's weapons. And those weapons, we've said, are found in Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. You need to do that. One of the things I do every single day, I put on the helmet of salvation. I put on the breastplate of righteousness. I gird up my loins with the truth. I shod my feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I hold up my sword of the Spirit. I get my shield of faith. And I get ready to go to war just as though I'm in a spiritual war. And I have to remember that God has also given me weapons. And some of those weapons, and not all of them, but the four that I think are the main ones are prayer, large quantities of prayer, large quantities of reading Scripture, renewing our mind, our faith. Uh, we're going to hit that in church here in a few weeks. And then worship, the sacrifice of thanksgiving. And so, going back to 2 Corinthians 10, 3-4, it says, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, but the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Fortresses. One version says that the weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of flesh and blood, but they are mighty before God for the overthrow of and destruction of strongholds, dismantling, disarming, demolishing, tearing down of strongholds, or to knock down the devil's strongholds. Matthew 12, 29. It says, how can anyone enter into a strong man's house and carry off all of his property unless he first binds, ties, handcuffs the strong man, and then he'll be able to plunder his house. I don't think I'd be able to go into one of those right tackles of the LSU Tigers from last night that was six foot six and weighs 350 pounds and just waltz into his house and rob him clean, would I? So I, need, I would need to use a different strategy. Well, I need to realize that there's a strong man, he owns that house, those things belong to him, he's been there a long time, he's dug in, he's entrenched, he ain't going nowhere, and he's going to protect his property. So if I just go straight up in there, I'm going to have a fight on my hands and I'm probably going to get tore up. So if I want to 
plunder that house and take all the stuff out of that house, then I'm going to have to come up with a different strategy. I'm going to have to figure out some way to catch him off guard. And take him prisoner and handcuff him and tie him to a chair and so that he can't move. And then once I've taken him out or dismantled him or uprooted him or demolished him or tore him down <coughs> or I'm in control of him, then, then I can go in and do whatever. And so I was thinking about this also in this verse, Matthew 12, 43 through 45. It says, now when an unclean spirit or a demonic stronghold, okay? Let's look at that. Unclean spirits are basically demonic things that are looking for fortresses to develop a stronghold, to become strong men, to take over your house. So that you're not in control of your own house. So when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he gets delivered from a demonic stronghold. It passes through waterless places seeking rest and it does not find it. Then it says to myself, I know what I'll do. I'll return to my house. Listen to that. The unclean spirit said, that's my house. That's what he's saying. So he, the unclean spirit, is cast out or delivered out of the house, but he's still thinking, that's my house. Uh, it belongs to me. He got booted out, but in his mind, that belongs to me. How I many you know the devil can't stand the fact that we've been delivered from a lot of things, has he? But how do you know we, we ran with the devil for years, didn't we? Okay? We were one of his best boys. You know, he's not going to just say, okay, it's okay for you to jump fence and join us. No, 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 no. He may let you waltz and walk out there, but you know, in his mind, he, he thought he had you. So it says here when he's when these unclean spirits are cast out, he says, I know what I'll do. I'll return back to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it unoccupied, swept, and put in order. This word unoccupied is a, the Greek word means to be at leisure. <laughs> okay? How many of you have ever get off work and you just kind of kick off your shoes and you pick up the lazy boy and you get you some ice cream or whatever and you just kind of leisure, you're kicking around, rainy day outside, you're just kind of, you're not paying attention, you're kind of being lazy, not paying attention to what's really going on around you, you know, you, you know, and it says that the spirit, when it comes back, it finds the house swept in an order, unoccupied, put in order, then it goes and says, huh? Ain't no strong man here. Ain't nobody care what's going on in this house. I thought I got booted out. I thought they turned me out. But look, there ain't nobody. There ain't nobody at home here. Nobody cares what's going on. There's somebody being lazy. They're asleep. I can walk right in here and take back to this house. And he runs outside and says, "Hey, boys!" And he brings seven more with him. Hey, fellas! That guy that got delivered. That all those. Lusts and pornography and addictions and all those things and he he's he's uh he's got his uh his uh three meals and in, in, a, in a bed now and he's all healthy he's at leisure now he's got his recovery he thinks he's got it going on he's not been working his cover he ain't journaling he ain't praying he ain't going to be he ain't doing nothing he's just kicking back we can go in there and take this thing over and we can make it seven times worse than it ever was. So they go in and live there. And the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. And listen to it. That is the way it will be with this evil generation. How many of you have seen this? You heard me preach for weeks about the depraved mind. That means the mind that the guy that went over and over and over again. God delivered him. God healed him. He went back out and came back and delivered and God finally just got to a point where he turned him over to a depraved mind, got back him off and 
he, he turned over to a river being behind. That means Elijah's been abandoned by God. This is, this is what happens when you know we get delivered and our spirits, our strongholds, are, are the evil influences and you know those uh, uh, those uh, unclean spirits. And so we've got you know we've got all these that our house. You know, it, you know, our house that uh, once had the had the devil as the strong man. You know, we had all these different things, and we got delivered. We got delivered. He went out here, and then he brought back seven worse and made it seven times worse. And so these e unclean spirits now have gotten deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, and they've taken over our house. And so if we're ever going to have freedom from the battlefield of the mind and the stinking thinking. You know, we're going to have to use these weapons of our warfare. We're going to have to get busy. Uh, and we're going to have to bind up these strong men first. You know, you can't just go on and, and go into the deeper things of God, man, if you've got a, a, an addiction to pornography. Okay? You, you, that, that's, going to, that's going to haunt you. It's going to get you. If you've got a stronghold of love of money or pride or fear or lust or insecurities, if you've got these strong, how in the world can you occupy and take care of your house? You got. You can't be at leisure. You got to be kicking butt and take names. You got to be working your program. You got to be renewing. You got to work. You got to apply the tools. You got to get in there and, and take over your house. And and if not, then it's going to come back and be seven times worse. And and these strongholds are going to get tougher and tougher and tougher. Amen. Amen. So we're going to talk tonight about strongholds. If you remember when we went through the inner healing, the book that we 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 gave you in here. On pages 110 through 121, have two whole chapters on strongholds. Just beginner kind of stuff. So I'm, I've taken some of that and I'm going to build on it tonight. But the word stronghold, is the word fortress or stronghold is the word akaroma. It's I think the way you spell it. It's only mentioned one time in the whole New Testament. That word. Which kind of freaks me out a little because... It's such a serious thing. I mean, you know, we're dealing with strongholds, or you know, they, they prevent you from doing what God's called you to do. And you can go through years and years and years, and if you don't deal with certain strongholds, they're going to come back to bite you. I know pastors have been in the ministry 25, 30 years, and they never dealt with their lust, and it's come back to haunt them, and now they're walking on the streets with depraved minds because they never dealt with these strongholds. Are inevitable if you don't deal with them. So the word the word refers to a it's a fortress or an ancient it refers to an ancient point. Ancient means it's been there for a long time. It's been you know it's, it didn't just show up overnight. That's you know we're not talking about that. We're talking about ancient fortresses. It depicts something. It depicts a fortified place or a fort that is well established. Well developed, well organized, well equipped. It's impregnable or impenetrable. It refers to a place that is has high walls, high fortified walls that are thick, ancient kind of walls, and you know that are permanent in nature. The people inside have dug in; they're entrenched. In permanent warfare with long-term intentions of standing against any foe that will outlast them. Bring it on. They're prepared for they're pre prepared to, till death. I went to this place called Masada up there, and if you read the story of that, these people lived up to where Herod's thing were. You know, and they, they held that ground, held that ground, and when it came down to it where they, they were about to lose, they all killed themselves. There were seven of them, they, they cast lots and they each stabbed each other and the last person had to kill them. So they, make it, they had to cast lots to see which one was going to kill himself. And, and at the end, it, that's how dug in they were. They were till death to us part. And that's what these strongholds are. I went, up, I went to uh, Jerusalem and saw the city walls. Man, they're super high, super wide. They've got moats around them. And probably at the time they had alligators in them or whatever. And, you know, these things were... They were meant for nobody to be able to get in and nobody to be able to get out. 
So we're referring to uh, a, something like a, a fort or a castle, like a Fort Knox or a prison or a citadel. And so I like this definition of a stronghold. A stronghold, you know, we have good hold, we have good strongholds and bad strongholds, okay? I had a lot of deep, bad strongholds that I had to be delivered of, and and I've I've uprooted them, I've untangled them, uh, and I've, they're not as dug in, they don't affect me, but I'm aware, but they still harass me, okay? And there's other good strongholds. I have good strongholds in my life, good strongholds of discipline in the Word, discipline in my prayer life. Not so much at the gym, but you know other disciplines and things. And so, write this one down. This is what I like. The definition I like is a stronghold is a deeply ingrained, woven into the fabric of something, deeply ingrained habit pattern, a practice or a way you've done business all your life. So it's a deeply ingrained habit pattern or a thinking process. Strongholds are deeply ingrained habit patterns or thinking processes. They're practices, habits, weight, behaviors, and things we've done all of our life that are entrenched. They're dug in. They've been there for a long time, and they just go deeper and deeper and deeper. We call them stronghold because they have a strong hold on us. They influence and hinder our behavior and thoughts and keep us from being able to live out the Christian life. They affect the way we view life and uh, the way we view ourselves, the way we view God, the way we view others. And they control us, they dictate to us, they govern us, they rule us, they master our behavior. Instead of us mastering and dictating those. How many know Deuteronomy says that we've been called to be the head, not the tail? We've been called to be the blessings and the curses. Somewhere, somewhere that thing got turned upside down because of our disobedience. But Deuteronomy says, if we obey the Lord, 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 we'll become the head and not the tail. We'll become the giver and not the, the borrower. You'll be blessed coming in, blessed going out. You'll be above and not beneath. I like that. Instead of them controlling me, I'll control them. Today I've got a lot of strongholds, you know. There are some things in my life, but you know what? I'm in control of them. Not all the way, but they don't dictate. They don't just say, okay, today we're going to lust and today we're going to smoke dope and, and do drugs and watch porno and all, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, they, 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 they just don't have that influence in my life. So, uh, stronghold two is a mindset that is impregnated with seeds of hopelessness or lies which cause me to accept as unchangeable something that I know is contrary to the will of God, any type of thinking or lofty thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God, thereby giving the devil a foothold in a secure place and influence where he eventually establishes strongholds in my thought life and become deeper and deeper and deeper. How do we know we got a stronghold? Because it's an area of my life that I consistently fail in. I'm going, Dad, damn it, I don't want to do that. You know, the very thing I don't want to do, I find that I do. And, you know, and, and you mean well. You hate what you do, but you find that you just keep doing it over and over again. And you don't get victory. That's how you know you've got a stronghold. And it's, it doesn't mean you're a bad person. It just means you've got a lot more work to do in that particular area of your life. You gave more right to the devil. It's deeply ingrained. It's been a habit pattern. It takes. They say it takes about seven weeks to develop a bad habit. Or any habit, for that matter. And I can't tell you how long it takes to, to change that habit or whatever. And I'm sure it's more, but it's an area we constantly fail in, that we're powerlessness over, that produces hopelessness and despair and an inability to change when we want to change. Good stuff. Now, Luke 17, 6. I'm 
Luke 17, 6. Jesus talked about forgiveness and that, hey, no matter how many times somebody does you wrong, you keep forgiving, okay? You keep forgiving. And the disciples were wrestling with that and they, they said, well, man, we don't have that kind of faith to forgive over and over and over. Uh, you know, it's just deep in us. I mean, the fun forgiveness is, is, is a deep one. Uh, you just can't seem to let go and forgive. So anyway, they go and say, uh, the apostles said, well, Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had the faith or the God kind of faith, the size of a mustard seed, I showed you a picture of that Sunday in church, a tiny, 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 you would be able to say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted, torn down, dismantled, and it would be planted in the sea planted in the sea, and it would obey you. That word, uh, the word uh, mulberry tree is the word sycamine, which is where we get sycamore tree. If you, I learned a few things about sycamore trees. Matter of fact, I think they showed me what they felt was the Zac Zacchaeus tree that he climbed up in, and man, them, them trees are ancient. They're known for their longevity. They've been around forever and forever and forever and forever and forever. And the reason they've been around forever and forever is their root system just is incredible. It just goes deep and deep and deep and deep. And they weathered storm after storm after storm after year. They say you can cut it off, John Wilder. They can cut that tree with a chainsaw down to the ground and it'll come back again. The only way you're going to kill a, a, a mulberry tree or a sycamore tree is to come in there with a backhoe and you're going to have to get up under every single last little tentacle of that thing or it's going to come back. And so Jesus is talking about strongholds. He says, for example, you know, unforgiveness. If you had the faith the size of a mustard seed, you could speak to that mulberry tree, that area of unforgiveness, and you could... It could be uprooted completely all the way down and cast into the sea. And so Jesus is probably sitting around at a sycamore tree teaching on forgiveness. And he says, take this sycamore tree. Let's look at that in the area of unforgiveness. It's deep, it's deep, it's deep. You might think you can't forgive, but God, Jesus says, no, 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 no. I don't care how deep the roots are. Nothing's impossible for God. If you had the faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to that thing, be rooted up and cast in the sea. Now that's quite a task. Thank you, but with God, God can, can take hold of these strongholds and He can deliver you and set you free. I've seen and heard of people that uh, develop, uh, have delivered of strongholds just like that. Now, most of them, my experiences, they take quite a long time to deal with, but I got delivered of cigarettes and alcohol just like that after 25 years of struggling. Them boys laid hands on me and dunked when I got up in there and it was over with. I don't know where they went, but they... Didn't stay around there. So we have these unre so we have these mulberry trees, these sycamore trees, these strongholds, these deep great that have dug deep, deep, deep down. They've been there for and they're gonna take a while to, to give up, but we've been given authority to bind up what's been bound in heaven and to loose what's loosed on heaven, haven't we? Yeah. And so with God's help, there's a lot of hope. Now let me show you how this thing works a little. Most of you have Probably seen this before. We'll, we'll look at a certain mulberry tree called. Let's look at unforgiveness tonight. How it works, and we're gonna we're gonna be visiting this same little thing. You've seen it before. We'll, I've used it in other teachings, and we're gonna use it some more. But we have a thought. Then we have. An attitude. Let me ever have an attitude. Behavior. Habit. And stronghold. Or a fortress. Or consequent or result. It starts here, and we go through this process here. And this is how we end up with strongholds. 
Because I'm going to tell you what, what happens when you refuse to forgive somebody. Okay? So, we have a, a thought. Let's call it a seed. The devil sows a seed on the ground. Let's call this our soul. Or let's just say the devil puts a thought or a seed into our head. And somebody says something to me and whatever and, and I get offended. And that's very common, is it not? So a thought comes to me. Now I've got a choice what I do with that thought, and this is where bringing thoughts captive. But I want to see what happens when, when, uh, when I, uh, when I dwell on something and I start chewing on it, and I don't deal with that thought, and I don't bring that thought captive. Then he goes to the next stage, which becomes an attitude, and I take on that offense, and I cop an attitude. So I, I get offended. I choose not to bring that thought captive and take it to the Lord instead. I'm chewing on it, I'm dwelling, I'm sitting in the middle of the night, I'm going like this, this, this. Next thing I'm going to go, that rat. I think I want to punch him. And you're ready to get up out of the bed and make a phone call and go light him up and, you know, and, and you're taking on that offense. Okay? <clears throat> then you keep doing and now you're, now you, you're taking on, now, now you begin to hold resentment. And this is where the behavior turns into what? This is where this is where uh, the foothold comes in. Ephesians four twenty seven says, "Do not give the devil a dead burn opportunity. Don't give him any opportunity. Why?" Because if you give him an opportunity, he, he won't just take an inch, he'll take a foot. He wants the whole house. Okay, you've got to realize, if you, if you let just a little bit of lust in, next thing you know, they can poison you. And next thing you know, I mean, we got a whole bunch more teachings on it. I'm going to go there tonight. But it said, the Amplified says, don't leave, don't give the devil an opportunity. Don't leave any room or a foothold. Don't let him even get his foot in the door. I remember one time in my addiction, we was all partying, smoking crack or whatever. We got a knock uh, at the door and we looked through the peephole, and there's a pretty girl right there. And we're like, well, yeah, the girls are here. And uh, next thing I open the door, and next thing I know, this big old burly drug dealer jammed his foot in the door. And fortunately, I knew right away what was going on, and man, it was on. But I finally got that rascal. You know, it overpowered him and he didn't get in. But boy, he sure, all he wanted to do was get one foot in that door and then he could have plundered my whole house. Okay? And that's the way the devil works. If you just give him that one foot, oh, you might think, you may, I call it dabbling in darkness. You go to plane, you go messing with a snake, it's going to bite you. You go messing with the devil, you're no match for him. He's going to, you know, you can't play with this stuff. Okay, so here, here you've, you got a you've got a thought you didn't deal with your whole resentment now now you're take you're holding resentment and that becomes the foothold the devil's got his foot in there now the, the habit becomes a practice and now you've entered into a call called a judgment called unforgiveness that means you make you take upon yourself that you're not going to forgive you hold unforgiveness that makes you the judge judgment means to render a verdict between two opinions, I mean, you decide, hey, you know, I want to forgive, and I choose not to forgive, and now you refuse to give. And what does Matthew 6, 14, 15 say? It says, if you don't forgive others for their transgressions, your if you forgive, then God will forgive you. But if you do not forgive, then he will not forgive you for your transgressions. And we know that has a boomerang effect. So when I choose not to forgive other, you know, then it becomes a boomerang and it comes back to me. Okay, and now it's gone. Now it's gone from a thought and attitude behavior to habit. And now the next step is what we call a stronghold, a deeply ingrained habit pattern or behavior that manifests itself in uh, in the area of forgiveness. It would be called a bitter root. 
Notice root, spirit, or attitude. It's a consequent and a result. The last stage is that I get a bitter spirit. How many of you have ever seen someone with a bitter spirit? Man, you just go, man. Ooh. Especially now that I'm born again. I remember guys that I used to work with, man, they talk about everybody. They were bitter, angry. I mean, they were just a poison. You couldn't even be around them. And it gives all truth to Hebrews 12, 15. says, see to it. Make sure. The writer of the Hebrews is saying, man, don't, don't, don't even let it get past the thought. If you do, it's going to turn into an attitude. It's going to give the devil a foothold. It's going to turn under a and you're going to end up with a bitter root spirit. Don't say, oh, that'll never happen to me. That'll never happen. Trust me, the, the devil will throw something at you. I mean, okay? I mean, they're, they're, he'll, he'll, he's good. You know? He's always throwing me a new curveball. I'm like, ooh, that was a good one. I'm going through a safe stage of my life I've never been to before. It's, it's totally new. It's different. I'm being tested at a level I've never been tested with personal, just different things. And, and it's, it's frustrating. It's hard because I've never been there. But how can I increase my faith if I keep getting tested on the same old things? If I'm going to grow in my faith and I'm going to go into the deeper levels and the narrow game, going deep, God's going to have to test me at a deeper level. And that's where I'm at. And, I'm, the Lord's, and I go, oh, okay. Now I realize I've got a choice. I can drink the cup. I can carry the cross. Yeah. I can fight the good fight. I can finish the course. I can run my waist. I can embrace it. I can get better or I can get bitter. I've got a choice on what I want to do. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm not going backwards, man. Mm -hmm. I'm all in. Amen. I don't know how this thing's going to turn out. I don't know, but I'm trusting the Lord with all my heart. I'm leaning not alone and understanding. I'm acknowledging Him in all my ways, and He's going to direct my path. And we're going to get through the thing. The God that brought me 22 years, the same God that's going to take me all the way. He's promised me I'm not going to disqualify myself, but one day I'm going to stand in His presence. Well done, good and faithful servant. It's going to be all good, and everything the Father has is going to belong to me. It's going to be glorious, ain't it? So he says, see that no root of bitterness, see that no one comes short of the grace of God because it's the grace of God that keeps us from this. See that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble and many be defiled. The Amplified says, in order that no root of resentment, rancor, bitterness, or hatred shoots forth and causes trouble and bitter torment, and many become contaminated and defiled by. I mean, you know, when I get a bitter root spirit, it's contagious. It has, it, you know, I throw up everybody. So here it started out as a seed. Somewhere it dropped down into my heart, and then it began to take over, over, and over, and then they began to drop these tentacles deep, deep, deep down to the point now where it's so dug in, it's so intrigued, I've got a bitter root spirit, and now not only has it messed up my life, and now there's no heart, now it's affecting everybody around me. The fruit and the byproduct of the root is everybody else becomes corrupted and defiled. So the Hebrew writer said, make sure you don't go there. Catch it way back here. So to win the battlefield of the mind, to deal with this, this stinking thing, at first we have to go in and we have to disarm the strong man. We have to bind him up. We've got to get down into these areas that are in our house, in our soul. We've got to identify the good strongholds. We've got to identify the bad strongholds. We've got to replace the bad with the good. We've got to renew in the spirit of the mind. We've got to apply the prayer, the word, our faith, the worship, the weapons of our warfare. And we get to us. The weapons of our warfare are divinely powerful for the what? For the destruction of forces and strongholds. If we have this right here, the way we start is right here by the weapons of our warfare. You get into that prayer closet and say, God, deliver me, deliver me, deliver me. I'm not stopping until you get this thing out of me. I'm going to read that word. I'm going to read that word. Wash it in my mind. I'm going to hold my shield of faith up. I'm not giving up. I'm not quitting. I'm going to worship and worship and worship. We're going to talk more next week about uh, identifying these things. And we've got a list back there of common character defects that you might get started on. We're going to learn about you know, getting into the journal, getting into uh, the DMI, 
in identifying these strongholds, we're going to give them a better. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Next week, Strongholds Part 2. Lord, we love you. We bless you. We thank you. Allow this information to drop into Revelation. Uh, let it impact our lives and our souls, Lord. And, oh, Lord, help us and deliver us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.